Darkwood is a great example of a small group of passionate, ambitious developers releasing a title that puts many other titles to shame with a fraction of the budget. Three college friends from Poland who were easily scared created a survival horror title that didn't rely on jump scares, and ended up with one of the best, unique horror experiences to come out in the last few years. It's unforgiving and bleak the style that only Eastern European developers can do. It uses several contentious game mechanics, yet manages to enhance the experience through them instead of frustrating the player. Darkwood is one of those games that's been sitting in my backlog for a while. Something I bought on sales years past, but I only got around to only now. I wish I had played it sooner. Let's look at why that's the case. Darkwood has a great prologue. It's economical in its purpose. Give us an overview of the game mechanics while building out the mood of what we're in for. Plus, you could skip the prologue and go right to day one for subsequent playthroughs. We start with a short blurb of what's been going on. There's been a plague in the area. The woods have closed them off from the outside world. We start off playing as a doctor. You find a man while out in the woods, unconscious with a journal and key. He's an outsider, not from these parts. The doctor interrogates him seeking a way of escaping the woods. We then switch to the other man, who serves as our protagonist, and escape. We explore the doctor's house. He seems to be up to some questionable things. We're then attacked and end up in a different location in the woods. Day one, and Darkwood begins proper. A unique element of Darkwood comes from the top-down perspective. A perspective rarely seen in horror games. First person? Common. Over the shoulder? Yep. Fixed camera? A relic of the past, while indie's keeping the perspective alive. Isometric? Not as common, but some horror games use it. Horror titles like Conscript and Signalis are somewhere between isometric and top-down. Signalis has the camera zoomed in, yet Darkwood gives a far distance between us and our character. Unlike Signalis's heavily pixelated look, Darkwood keeps things clear and crisp. It's a simple yet effective approach. But the further distance away, the game gets our minds to work to fill in the blanks. Even from a distance, you can see how terrifying these creatures of the woods are. How would they look from a closer view, a view from the first person? There's enough given for us to have an outline of what to expect. Yet not enough for the full picture, and our mind fills in the rest. It's brilliant use of the fear of the unknown. What our minds can conjure will always be more terrifying. But there are cases where we get closer look at others. We could have conversations with some of the characters we come across. We could gossip, trade, and show them key items we found. During these conversations, we shift to the first person. I love the way these characters are presented. The simple animation gives life to them, yet they're still hidden away in the shadows. The dark color palette helps in creating a distance from them. There's a sense that something is off with them, which becomes clear in our conversations. They have their own goals and objectives, and they're hard to get a read on. While we have the top-down view, it's not like we have clear vision of all around us. We have a cone of vision that's determined by the lighting. Carrying a light source like a torch increases visibility. One perk we can use allows us to see all around us for a limited time, once a day. Open stretches in the outdoors offer more visibility, while areas dense with trees cut down on light. Within houses and underground passages, narrow stretches offer very little light. In a way, it's like a fog of war from RTS titles. You can see the outlines of your environment, but not what's within it. This is where so much of the tension arises in Darkwood. You could hear something making noise right around the corner, but out of sight. A friend? A foe? Nothing? Something you weren't ready for? This perspective paired with stunning sound design results in some of the best tension I've come across in horror titles. I'm a broken record at this point talking about how important sound design is to horror. Both in knowing when to be silent, when to give tiny auditory drops, and when to ramp it up. Darkwood has some of the best sound design I've come across in a game. The genre that's known for having some of the best sound design in games, that's saying quite a lot. It's less about distinct audio cues, which there are plenty of, but the way sounds layer on top of one another, the simple rustle of leaves and crunching of footsteps out in the woods. Was that me, or was that something else? Certain landscapes will shift the soundscapes, with some shifts to the background music. It's slow in the background, but noticeable enough to help evoke a mood.
For audio cues, you'll come to learn the sounds of enemies that will make you bolt in the other direction, keeping combat at the last resort. <laughs> The best demonstration of the audio design comes from the night sections in the hideout. But before we talk about these stretches, let's look at some of the gameplay elements first. Darkwood has a select rhythm to its gameplay. During the day, we explore the woods, complete tasks, collect items, and prepare for the night. By night, we get comfy in our hideout and deal with what the night throws at us until morning comes. What's interesting about Darkwood is how it makes use of procedural generation. A term for me that tends to raise red flags. I'll take handcrafted whenever possible, thank you very much. The key locations have the same layout no matter the playthrough. Where they appear will vary. It's the woods themselves that receive procedural generation. In a game with high replayability, it'll keep you from going on autopilot as locations change for each playthrough. Yet at the same time, these key areas have the handcrafted treatment. It's the best of both worlds. One of the many genius design decisions with Darkwood comes from the map system. The map will show landmarks like your hideout, a camp, ruins. When we're within range of a landmark, the map highlights that section, but we're never given the exact location of where we are. Well, not exactly true. One perk once a day allows you to see where your exact location is on the map. We have a general idea of where we are, but never exact. If you're not careful, you may end up lost when looking for something. You might come across items you want to collect out in the woods, but have no free space. If it's not near a landmark, you have to pay special attention to where it is. The game tells you each loading screen to respect the woods. I can't overemphasize how important this point is. Of everything we deal with in Darkwood, the woods itself is the greatest of foes. Respect it or find yourself lost and overwhelmed. As the song by Queens of the Stone Age says, you don't find the way, the way finds you. Resource management is an integral part of the survival horror experience. Some games are more forgiving, others are not. Darkwood leans to the latter. We have a limited inventory, although we could drop items anywhere. We have a place to store them in our hideouts. There's always a choice to make, and always a cost. Before you know it, your inventory can be full when you're out on your excursions. Not all items are equal. Some items can stack many on top of each other in one slot, like matches. On the other side, items like gasoline tanks fill up a slot each. Through crafting, you can expand your inventory. That said, you could also increase the number of hockey slots available, which does give you one extra slot. An upgrade of your inventory gives two extra slots each time. You start with three hotkeys. Upgrade requirements are the same for either. Which do you value more? For the most part, more inventory slots are the better choice. Are three hotkey slots enough for what you're doing at the time? Otherwise, you need to pause and open your inventory. This takes time. This leaves you vulnerable. You may find yourself in situations where you wish you had that extra hotkey slot available. And there are benefits to more hotkeys in regards to the penalty of death. More on that later. One of the major issues I have with most modern games tends to be around items. Item collection for the sake of it. Busy work. Darkwood can veer into it at points, but not to the same level. Each item can serve many purposes. For example, gasoline can fill up generators, turn logs into wood, or in crafting of other items. There's always a choice to be made. Although I will note one of Darkwood's major faults is how easy it is to fill up your inventory, even with an upgrade and expanded inventory, where you have to decide what to drop and what to keep. You may be far away from your hideout when this occurs. You can find shortcuts back to your hideout, but I still found this happening more often than it should. I'm all for getting the player to decide over what to keep and what to drop. That said, I found it happened a bit too much throughout the course of the game. Not a huge detriment, and I can respect the developers with what they're going for. That said, over the course of the game I found it added more frustration as opposed to tension. I wonder how dialing back even a tiny bit would change the experience. We aren't alone in the woods. We'll come across several enemies to deal with. When possible, it's best to avoid combat. That's not always going to be the case. Darkwood does a great job of delivering tension with its combat system. When your attacks hit, they hit hard. Once again, the excellent sound design adds to the oomph factor. Each melee weapon has a couple of attacks. One with a wind-up that uses less stamina. One that does not need a wind-up but uses more stamina. You have to weigh your attacks with care. There are several times I miss an attack with my timing. This would induce further panic and cause me to take damage and even maybe miss again. Depending on the amount of light you have and where you're located, fights are claustrophobic. If you dodge their attack, you'll have to reorient yourself to see where they're coming from. The last thing you want to hear in a low-light environment is the sound of an approaching enemy when you don't have sight of it.
Some perks can come handy in a pinch. One perk allows you once a day to cry out in a roar that scares off enemies. In some cases, this can mean the difference between life and death. Durability is something to be aware of. Weapon durability is always a controversial design decision. I find it works very well in Darkwood. It adds more to the tension than frustration. You can upgrade weapon durability. As well, it's not like they break forever. You can repair these weapons. But it's something to always consider in combat situations. Guns are another option, although crafting them requires a large investment. But it's not like they turn the game into a cakewalk. You need to hold down your aim for an accurate shot, so it's not a walk in the park as a result. Ammo is sparse throughout Darkwood. The last thing you want to be doing is missing shots, which I fell victim to in cases where enemies making a beeline for me when I didn't have clear sight of them. One design decision that further keeps you on edge is time. While it does let up in a few areas, it's a constant presence and a race to get things done. Get what you need for the day and make your way back to the hideout to hole up for the night. At first, you have no way to track time beyond the great outdoors, the change of the sun and lighting. Your character will give a warning about 90 minutes in game time that you should be getting back to your hideout. There was a lot of fun in these early stretches of guessing what time it was, whether I wanted to venture further out or stay close to the hideout. You can circumvent this by buying a watch. Super handy and a worthwhile investment. At this point, the game ramps up on difficulty in other areas, so having an idea of time at all times is a large relief. Even then, you still have to be aware of it, always keeping an eye on it. You know, now that I think about it, Darkwood has some great integration of controversial mechanics that reminds me of Dead Rising, without the escort missions present, of course. There is one quest where you find someone and need to take them back home, but the game fades to black and does it for you. But to have weapon durability and time limits that enhance the experience? It's a tough act to pull off. Dead Rising did so, and so does Darkwood. That said, Darkwood is forgiving with time in various circumstances. One is at the beginning of a new day. As you trade, craft, and fix anything up around the hideout, time stands still. There's no need to rush. I'm not looking back, but I want to look around me now. Once you leave the premise, time resumes. This is a design decision I appreciate. It's a bit of a breather after what might have been a long night. Other sections will have time standing still, like venturing through the village. The first time I went there, I didn't have a watch and had concerns about time. Then I realized, wait a minute, they stopped the clock. Feel free to take your time and explore. You could feel the old school Fallout influence in the villages, something the developers mentioned as a key influence. Although it's not like we're a welcome presence. We're an outsider. It's not like things are any better for the people living here. Darkwood gets especially spooky once night falls. Things that go bump in the night come out to see what's up starting around 8 p.m. This is where you want to get comfy in your hideout. Barricade up the windows and doors. Push drawers in front of doors. Get the generator running and have lamps nearby. Be patient for the morning to come. You don't want to be making noise to get attention. What happens next can vary. Night sections are the game's best showing the game's strong sound design to keep you on edge. Even pulling from horror cliches, it still does a great job of invoking dread. Like having doors creak open at a snail's pace. The sound of footsteps outside. or someone knocking at doors. The silence between them can be almost as loud as whatever noise we hear. Sometimes we'll have enemies breaking down the barricades to come after us. Other times we'll come across encounters that don't occur elsewhere, like the shadows emerging, forcing us to stay by a light source. or a black fog emerging within the hideout, or banshees making their way in. They always keep you on edge and keep you guessing what's next, and I love it. Although I will have one criticism here. 
One of the game's main criticisms. As great as these stretches are, I would have been fine if they cut down the time by a small stretch. Only a little, but I would have felt the pacing would be better. I'm sure they went through many balancing acts on this front. Would the game work better if they cut around, let's say, 15% of the night stretches and gave that to day stretches? I'm not sure, but it becomes more noticeable during each further night. Depending on how long your playthrough is, nighttime can become more of a chore than a challenge. And there are fewer things that generate more relief when the night ends. That swelling sound of music, the fade to white, letting us know it's daytime, mwah, chef's kiss. The morning gives us time to catch our breath and trade goods. There are others as well within the woods we could trade with, but in the morning, the traders come to us. It's not through money, but with reputation. Survive the night and you'll gain a reputation bonus. In some cases, it's the difference you need to get that item you've been saving for. Unlike Joan Jet, you do want to give a damn about your reputation. As we progress through the woods, we'll unlock further hideouts. At first, I had concerns of having to move all my stuff over to the next hideout. You can find an item that allows you to summon the bike man. For a bottle of alcohol, he'll move goods from one hideout to the other. Thanks, Bike Man. Depending on difficulty and location, death can be game over, a hassle, or a minor inconvenience. On Nightmare Mode, one death and it's game over. On Hard Mode, you have a select amount of lives. You can replenish them with certain items. My first attempt at Dark Mode was on Hard, which ended after several days and still getting a feel for the game. Then you have Normal Mode with unlimited lives. It's not like there are no penalties upon death. When killed on normal or hard, your character drops several of your items at the place of death. This is where having more hotkey slots comes in handy. You won't drop what's in your hotkey slots. If you're killed during the night within the hideout, no big deal. Your items will be right there. Get killed out in the wild and things are more challenging. It will appear on your map, but again with the map not being precise, finding the backpack can be a challenge. In the old woods, I found myself dealing with enemies I wasn't exactly prepared for. A noticeable step up of what came prior. I had a couple of deaths emerge in combat situations out in the wilderness when I should have ran. This led to frustration where I was getting angry and would get sloppy. I had a couple more deaths to pile on top afterwards, thinking this time I'll get all my stuff back. This only made things worse. I've been playing for a while at this point. Despite how tough it can be, thinking this time I'll get it never seems to work. So I shut the game off and came back to it the next day and was able to recover. I'm sure if you played the Soul series, you have a similar experience. Several tries to pass a boss or area with many deaths, more frustration. Then you come back a day or so later and you do so in one or two tries. Which is fitting as the developers mentioned Dark Souls to be one of their main inspirations. While there can be frustrations with Darkwood, most of that falls on the player. On the loading screen, there's mention to respect the woods and be patient. I was able to get away with somewhat sloppy play during the first two wood sections. Most deaths were in the safe house if there were. A small penalty as a result. You don't get the reputation bonus, but this becomes less of an issue as the game progresses. It's where the old woods where I received punishment for my arrogance, where I learned to give the woods the utmost respect. A string of deaths out in the woods led to a reduced inventory spread across the map or for whatever reason decide to turn on a radio in an underground section with red chompers around. I guess I'm that guy who would be the first to die in horror films. Trying to get that inventory back had the backpack surrounded by several chompers. That was a lost cause. Or pushing my luck in a situation with heavy rain, reducing vision even further. With light supplies had run out and a pack of dogs surrounding me, I was trapped in a corner, I'd chuck a Molotov cocktail. If I'm going to die, I might as well take him with me. or the arrogance of pushing out further than I planned, and locking the way back to the first woods section. Realizing I'm short on time and short on supplies, I make a mad dash for the first hideout, which was closer. I have next to no vision, with no light sources. I'm moving around the outhouse, trying to remember where the oven is to light it, and the location of the generator. I'm too late. <laughs> Thank you.
These were lessons I learned in my arrogance of not respecting the woods. By the time chapter two rolls around the swamp, I'm much more respectful. I'm walking far more often instead of running. I'm careful in scouting out potential threats. Although the game dials up with more difficult enemies here, it does also dial up on helpful supplies. While they don't make things a cakewalk, guns are more viable here due to the amount of ammo laying around. It's easy to find enough items that you could trade for high levels of reputation. Even then, there are still close calls or situations where I'm taken down. But at this point, I've learned to not push my luck. Few games outside of the Soul series I've played have done such a great job of punishing you for pushing your luck. We're moving into story and the major beats here, so here's your spoiler warning. Darkwood is cryptic with its narrative. The bleak nature of it never lets up. The game uses several means of dispersing the story to us. Our talks with those we come across, environmental storytelling with its locations, finding notes and items of interest. I do appreciate that Darkwood doesn't give large text dumps for found items, common cliche in horror titles or games in general. We do come across brief notes here and there, but very brief. Most items we find are photographs and various objects. At various points in Darkwood, we'll have dream sequences. One inspiration listed by developers is David Lynch. Those are more noticeable in the dream sequences. They're foreboding and touch on different kinds of tension horror than the main stretches. With the many characters we come across in our journey, their fates can turn out in different ways. But the game doesn't spell it out to us. And things are not black and white here, but plenty of grey. Not in the way that feels like the game is doing so for the sake of it like it's a marketing bullet point. And making you weigh over binary moral decisions. One of the best examples comes from the Doctor. We've been seeking him out since the beginning of the game. We're seeking out revenge for what he's done. Yet when it comes time to deal with him face to face, he gives his reasoning for his actions. We're an outsider. We're not from the village. As a doctor, people turn to him for help from the plague. He did what he could, trying to deal with this inexplainable illness. As things worsened, they began to hate him. There was only so much he could do, and he was only one doctor. As well, the plague didn't leave him the most sound estates. How would you react in this situation? Another thing I love about Darkwood is that NPCs don't feel like they're only quest givers. They have their own lives and goals, and you happen to come across them. Few games manage to nail that feel. Vampire Bloodlines is another one. While Darkwood has the same endpoint of escaping the woods, the journey of how we get there can differ. Not only through the procedural generation of the woods. When you find a certain key, you can give the key to the wolfman or the musician. These take you down different paths to reach the end destination. Same thing for the swamp in chapter two. You could burn down the talking tree or spare it. Both lead you to quote unquote leaving the woods, but how you get there differs. And once we finally merge, we can go home. But something doesn't feel right. You can go to sleep, but if you do some digging, both from a figurative and literal standpoint, you can find out what's going on. Before we get into this, let's take a step back. There's a lot of lore scraps spread throughout to piece together. It paints a picture of what may have happened here. I say may because not everything is clear cut. If you're interested in a more thorough explanation, I'll link to a detailed Steam guide in the description and pinned comment. In the mid 1970s, an object fell from the sky into the woods. This is when the plague started and would spread. Over a span of a few years, the plague would cause the forest to grow in such a way to block off the outside world. It didn't help the government barricade off the area to contain the plague. The plague has different impacts on people in the woods around them. In 1987, we, the protagonists, come in from outside the woods. Found wounded by the doctor, he demands to learn the way out. We become infected with the plague. When we reach the end game, we're not heading home. We're heading into the heart of the woods. We're heading towards the being, the object that fell from the sky over a decade ago. It's created this illusion and wants us to sleep under its spell. But we can resist.
A pause is one of the most engrossing closing moments to a game I've played in some time. What this being is, its purpose, what it seeks, is unknown. Something that's beyond our comprehension and understanding. We need to resist to keep from falling under its spell. We come across the many sleeping in its wake. Some have died. We can find one of our companions who came into the woods with us. He's carrying a flamethrower. As the sleeping cry out to us to stop, we can torch the place to the ground. We kill many others along the way, freeing them from the spell and their lives. And there's no escape for us. But with our sacrifice, we can remove the being and let the woods clear. Depending on our actions, we'll receive text blurbs of the fates of characters we've come across. That's a Cole's Note version of things happening. There's far more lore within that explains many of the things we come across. And even then, it's not clear cut. Much is implied, but not confirmed. And that's part of the beauty and the horror that helps make Darkwood such an outstanding game. It's one of those great indie success stories, one that was crowdfunded. Less than a handful of people with little experience, but ambition and drive to create. The end result is a game that puts many others to shame. It's a game I've been aware of for years. Despite what I heard, I would think, really? Is it that scary? From that perspective? The answer is yes. Few games can match its bleak atmosphere, the never-ending tension and horror within. It's one of those games after playing, I was kicking myself for not having played it earlier. I can't wait to see what Acid Wizard Studio puts out next. Oh, they did reveal that about a month ago. That being... Soccer Kids? In today's class, the king of sports, soccer. Coach! Yes, Michael. There's a new cartoon on TV. It's called Captain... This G is not a place for fairy tales. A tactical turn-based sports game? Well, that's not what I was expecting. Kudos to them for taking something in a far different direction. Unlike the traders in Darkwood, I guess they're more like Joan Jett. They do what they want and don't give a damn about their reputation. Thanks for watching. The defense. Let your team's movements on the field be as elusive as the wind, leaving the opposition in disarray.